This presentation is called Applying Hamilton's Rule and Inclusive Fitness Part 1. So the aim of this presentation is to relate Hamilton's rule to studies of animal behavior that have been conducted using that rule to help you understand it better. And you'll recall that what Hamilton was trying to explain was behavior that appeared to have altruistic consequences, and that means it harmed uh, the actor who engaged in that behavior while benefiting others. The harm was in terms of the reduced reproductive success of that altruistic actor, and the benefit was in terms of the improved reproductive success of the recipients of that action. So Hamilton's rule uh, simply argues that altruism can evolve when R times B is greater than C, and that means the benefit of that altruistic act has to be greater than its cost. But that cost specifically is the cost to the altruistic donor. The benefit is the benefit to the recipient of the altruistic act, and then R which is critical to the rule, is the relatedness between the donor and the recipient. And what Hamilton's rule is saying if, is that if relatedness is high enough relative to the cost and benefits, it can change the cost and benefits. Now a prediction that comes out of Hamilton's rule is kin selection. And this is the idea that social cooperation can evolve as close genetic kin assist one another. And this is based on Hamilton's argument that altruism, when it's practiced among close genetic kin, is actually a form of genetic self-interest. And if that's true, uh, then we should find that genetic relatedness matters in terms of how animals behave. Uh, by the 1970s, biologists went out into the field and started testing this. And one of the first tests of Hamilton's rule that became quite famous was a study of alarm calls in Belding's ground squirrel. So this is a little ground squirrel that lives in California. And one thing that some of the ground squirrels do is that when a predator is the, in the area, it might be a coyote, it might be a badger, it might be an eagle. But that predator comes around and some of these squirrels will stand up and shout an alarm so the rest run and hide. And this then is our behavioral trait of interest that we want to explain. Why is it that some of the squirrels sound the predator alarm? And you might say, well, why don't they all do it? Uh, what's the problem with this? Well, we're going to see. So. Paul Sherman undertook a three-year study of these ground squirrels and collected careful quantitative evidence that sorted through six different alternative hypotheses. And we're just going to give a very simplified account of what he learned. But the just-so story behind his study is the proposition that those callers may be gaining inclusive fitness by placing themselves in jeopardy if the benefits of their alarm calls are mostly their close genetic kin. So we call this a just-so story because that's all it is until we have the evidence to support it. The first paper that he published, well, the first in a series, was called Nepotism and the Evolution of Alarm Calls. And in this paper, published in the prestigious journal Science, Sherman argued that indeed, uh, nepotism was, in the case of belding ground squirrels, central to alarm calls. So let's look at some of his findings. One of his most important findings was that the caller who makes the alarm, the squirrel who alarms the others, pays a cost for doing that. And the cost they pay is getting eaten. One of the alternative hypotheses was that perhaps by Shouting the alarm, the squirrel that does that is less likely to be eaten. Uh, maybe it deters the predator and they leave the area. It turns out that's not the case, and uh, badgers and coyotes and eagles are more likely to eat the alarm caller uh, than anyone else in the group. So when you do this, it is an altruistic act. 
You're risking your life in a very immediate fashion in order to save the lives of others. And that's what we mean by altruism. His second finding was that it turns out that it's mostly females who are making these alarm calls. So this is a simplified rendering of his data. But what you can see there is the red marks, the observed alarm calls. And you'll notice that male yearlings and adult males make almost none of the calls. On the other hand, adult females make a great many calls, a great majority, and female yearlings make most of the rest. And if we look at what would be expected given their numbers in the group, we can see that males make far fewer calls than would be expected. Female yearlings make about the number of calls that would be expected, but the adult females make uh, many more than are expected. So it's mostly the females, uh, much more often than the males that are making the calls. His third finding was that even females without pups call more often than males. And this would be the yearlings. So it's not just mothers warning their pups. That's an alternative hypothesis here. That it's not inclusive fitness, but it simply would be direct fitness. Uh, mothers are doing things in order to benefit their own pups. Well, it turns out that females risk their life even when they have no pups to save, uh, to save the pups of others. So then the question arises, well, why are they doing this? What's their connection with those, those pups who aren't their offspring? Well, uh, the fourth key finding, and the one we're going to finish with here, is that females tend to live with other females, uh, with their close genetic relatives. So female pups stay with their mother and sisters. In the ground squirrels, it's the males who disperse. And that means the females are the philopatric's gender. Philopatry is staying with your natal group. Females do that. Males disperse. So now we can start to see something here. And this is that the males don't have close genetic kin around them. And perhaps this is why they look out for number one and don't shout alarms. Females do have close genetic kin around them. And they're much more likely to make the alarm. So the key uh, to how this would evolve and be sustained among uh, the female ground squirrels is inclusive fitness. We have to go beyond the relationship of parent to offspring and add in the indirect fitness of sisters to nieces. In this case, the uncles aren't very active. And so indirect fitness would be female ground squirrels caring for and giving alarm to save the lives of the offspring of their sisters. Uh, thank you for listening.